the secrets of wealth creation. Here to tell us is Daniel Strauss, the author of The Billionaire Mindset and The Billionaire Career. Welcome, Daniel. Thank you so much. Daniel, how do people make money when they don't have any money to begin with? So my mentor always asked me, if you don't know how to make money without money, what makes you think that you can make money with money? So a big lesson from my new book is actually where the main character has to start a business with little or no money. And there are various ways to approach this. But I, I think the most important thing is that on the one end of the spectrum, you get entrepreneurs that are self-funded, which is quite risky. But on the other side of the spectrum, you get people who are employed by someone else. And often they don't think that that's risky, but that is probably one of the biggest risks that you can take. Because in an economic downturn, companies lay off people and then everybody's laying off. So where do you find another job? But there's somewhere in the middle, somewhere in the middle. So that the whole idea is to move over from being employed to being an entrepreneur with the minimum risk. Now, what characteristics does one need to become a successful entrepreneur? So firstly, I think it's very important to understand that different people define success differently. Some people define success in terms of shareholder value. Some people define success in terms of cash flow. And some people define success in, in, in spiritual uh, sense or with the relationship with other people. So firstly, we must just be very clear on what our own definitions of success are. And then we must also get clarity on what gives us energy in business and what drains our energy in business. Because if you look, for instance, of the, for the, the path that uh, Jeff Bezos took to build Amazon is a completely different path than what Steve Jobs took, for instance, to start Apple or to grow Apple. And then if we can just get clarity on our own business superpowers, as we call them, which is really unpacked in the book, then you get much more clarity on how you within your own, own frame of reference and your own definition of success, how you can build a successful business. Does luck ever come into it, in, in, in your view? They say the most successful people don't create luck, but they know how to create an environment where the probability of luck is increased. So if you know how to create an environment where the probability of luck is increased, people might look from the outside and say you're lucky. Well, uh, I know you're big on mentorship and, and you had a mentor. Would you mind telling us about him? Yes, so I met him at an airport. One of my friends uh, called me one day and he said he wants to pick up his dad's business partner from the airport and do I want to come with him? And I'm like, yes, why not? Got to the airport and here was this Chinese Malaysian man in his 40s and we just clicked and he took me under his wing and for four years he literally taught me how the world really works and i was astounded because at that point in time i was an industrial engineer with an mba working at a private equity firm i mean i knew everything <laughs> and i very soon realized that i know nothing i literally had to start from scratch to learn how the world of business really works. So he took me to various countries. I mean, Malaysia, Singapore, Indonesia, uh, Hong Kong, various cities in China. And I literally attended um, various business meetings with him where he taught me everything he knew. And then he, one day I asked him, you don't get anything out of this. Why are you teaching me everything you know? And then he just said to me, all I ask is that you go and teach this to as many people as possible. Talking of business meetings, when one walks into a meeting and you're hoping to get investment or a backer, what's the most important piece of advice you can give that person who, who goes in there and nervous wreck? I think the most important part is firstly, don't go in as a beggar. Go in as someone who is giving someone else an opportunity to come on a journey with you. So that is a mindset change. 
And secondly, know when to speak above the line and when to speak below the line as we talk about it. So what is an investor really buying? An investor is buying a piece of paper, which is either a share of or a convertible preference share or a safe note in your company. And they want to know how the value of this piece of paper that they are buying will increase in value. And one of the biggest mistakes that entrepreneurs make is they actually pitch their products. So what I would often do just to convey the point is after the meeting, I will tell the entrepreneur, wow, this was a wonderful pitch. I would like to buy 10 of your products, please. And then they are very annoyed or astounded. And they would say, but I didn't pitch for you to buy my products. I pitched for you to invest in my company. I'm like, no, you pitched your product the entire time. For that reason, I, I will love your product. I want to buy it. But in order for you to get investment, we need to teach you how to think, how to speak above the line during an investor pitch. How exactly do you uh, define that above the line behavior? Um. So the line, uh, as we call it, is a very um, well-defined line in terms of the Companies Act. And that with the shareholders and the directors above the line, and the managers and the employees below the line. And we say that above the line, everything is possible, and below the line, only the budget is possible. The reason for that is that shareholders and directors have certain rights in terms of the Companies Act to raise funding through different methods that the managers and the employees will never have. So the challenge that we have is that if you were employed by someone else as a manager or an employee, and you start your own company and you don't learn to think like a shareholder and director very soon, then you will frustrate yourself as well as everyone around you. Now, you and your partners have invested uh, in quite a f in many business. Um, have you always been able to help them or uh, have there been failures as well? So some businesses fail, especially if we invest in, in very early stages. But what we found is, as we progressed, um, we seem to have less and less failures because we understand how to create that environment where the probability of success or luck is increased. What has been your biggest success, if you, if you, if you can tell us, in monetary terms? So I think in terms of, let's say, percentage terms, mm. one of our best investments, uh, we invested in December 2019 had a valuation of about 26 million rand. And within about 24 months, the business was worth 1.38 billion rand. So that was quite a, a significant uptick in value. Good heavens, may I ask what industry uh, that is in? So I try not to disclose too much about the companies okay. we invest in okay. because I don't want to it to seem like we are trying to take their success because, I mean, it was a wonderful entrepreneur, a wonderful team, a wonderful concept. So I don't want to take anything away from them. Um, we were just privileged to have the opportunity to invest in their company. Now, um, what business strategy did you use to help your then girlfriend, the beautiful Raleen Strauss, now your wife, win the Miss World title? So... All we can really do in any business or in any endeavor where we want to have success or where we have a goal is to increase the probability of success. So well, how my uh, mentor taught me was, first you must define risk. So I define risk by saying that it is the influence of uncertainty on an objective. So firstly, if you don't have an objective, it is the biggest risk that you can take. So her objective was to win the title. Then the next thing was, okay, how do we make sure that we increase that probability? So who was the target market? The target market was the judges. And what did they want? They wanted to have the best possible Miss South Africa or the best possible Miss World. And then we made a list of criteria at which they would look when they judge. And we made sure that she meticulously improved herself 
in each one of these criteria. We didn't change anything about it, but we just magnified those things that it was easier for the judges to see. It doesn't sound like you ever leave anything to chance, do you? I think anything that you can have an influence on to increase your probability of success, you have to do everything in your power. But sadly, there are just certain things that you, that you don't have any control over. What was the lowest point in your life? Uh, you've come a long way. Uh, take us back to the time when you sold newspapers for extra money. Yeah, so, I mean, then I was still a child, so I actually loved it. Um, and the thing that I learned there was I always wanted to know, okay, what is my chance of getting a proper tip? And uh, the biggest measure of at that point that I could see, I mean, I sold hundreds and hundreds of newspapers at so many houses, is the shoes of the woman of the house. If she had beautiful, <laughs> well-looked-after shoes, I normally got a bigger tip than if someone had a, a fancy sports car or anything standing outside of the house. That was normally my biggest measure of whether I would get a big tip or not. But to get back to my lowest point, that would probably have been 2008, 2009. So I just finished my MBA subjects and then it was a big recession. So for six months, I didn't have a job. I literally did not have any money. And that is when I, I made the promise to myself to say, I will never, ever be in a position like this again where I have to go to job interview after job interview and job interview just to hear, sorry, we're not hiring people. Sorry, you didn't get the job. And that's where I took full responsibility for my own life and my income for me and my family in my future. But when you wake up in the morning, what is your driving force? Is it money? Or is it something more spiritual? So to me, firstly, the most important thing to me is family and my relationship with my family and obviously my ability to to look after them um, financially, but also in, in various other ways. And then I love helping people. I really just love seeing other people reach their full potential. And then I... Because I had so many opportunities these days, when I when I was um, growing up in a very small town called Camus in the Northern Cape, I didn't have any opportunities. I knew about the children in the big schools who had all these opportunities. I didn't have them. But now that I have them, I would not be able to live with myself if I don't reach my absolute full potential. And that's really the, the driving force, is I have to show gratitude to everyone who invested their time in me to, to help me to grow. What is the most touching story you can tell us about somebody you have helped in that one? You know, there's, there's quite a lot of stories, but um, one of the most recent ones that come to mind is um, there was this entrepreneur who attended one of our seminars, and um, he's been working for, I think, about 10 years on a specific technology to turn, I think, plastic into diesel. Okay. And, uh, I mean, he was trying and trying and trying, and he just couldn't raise the funding and everything. And then through the process, I have these games that I play with people, strangest things. They throw um, dice at hula hoops, and they it's all, a, all these are things, little games, to make them realize that what they are busy with might not be the ideal way to move forward in their business. It's not the ideal way to increase their probability of success. And then through the process, he realized that it's actually easier to turn oil into diesel first and then get the cash flow. And then later he can go and turn the plastic into diesel. So within, I think, a few weeks after he attended, he actually raised funding started turning oil into diesel, got enough uh, cash flow to now make his dream come true, his bigger dream that he couldn't fund previously, but now he can fund. Now let's go back to your first book, um, The Billionaire Mindset. What, define the mindset, please. Can I start with a little story, please? Yes, please. So there was this 
soldier that uh, was in a concentration camp in World War II. And what he did was um, he lived in the worst conditions possible. I mean, you can imagine one of those concentration camps. And then one evening, he found a little radio and took the little radio and he tuned and he tuned it and he listened to it close to his ear because nobody else was allowed to hear. And he could hear faintly, there's a news bulletin on. And he couldn't hear much, but all he could hear was, the war is over. And quickly switched off the radio, put it away. And the next morning when he woke up, he already knew that there was hope, the war was over. But the other prisoners didn't know it, and the guards didn't know it either. But everybody came to him and said, wow, there's this change in you. You, you, you even look different, you glow different. What is it? And he couldn't tell anyone. Now, the mindset, when it changes and you realize that you thought you were in a war, but the war is actually over, but the rest of the people just didn't realize it yet, because now you've got a goal, you've got a method to get there, and you increase your probability of success to get there, then your mindset changes, and your own approach to everything you do changes either, and other people to see this magic in you, and they don't know why. Okay, let's go to your second book. Uh, I believe it's already turning into a bestseller, is that so? Yes, I'm so extremely grateful. This morning I walked into Exclusive Books Tiger Valley and it was already number one there. Um, it's already on the nationwide business bestseller lists. So uh, I'm just extremely grateful. So what is the core advice uh, that people will be able to find in that book? So this book is very different from my first book in the sense that it is a story book. And the reason why I did that was with my first book, I got extremely good feedback in the sense that people love the way in which I use little stories to explain uh, difficult business and investment concepts. And then I thought, how can I make this ex accessible to even more people? So there's this main character that goes through this journey of entrepreneurial growth with mentors and then people can really, really relate to all the struggles. I say, poor Dan, so the guy's name is Dan. I say, if he must walk in here now, he'll struggle. He'll, he'll probably strangle me because of all the difficult things I, I made him go through. But then he'll high-five me because there's a few great things that happened to him as well. So this is really a, a storybook, almost if you think of... Um, the richest man in Babylon, the alchemist, the monk who sold his Ferrari, that type of story with business lessons woven into the story. And the main message there is re really um, we define success differently, all of us. But all of us can reach our full potential within our own definitions of success. And if your definition of success is money, or shareholder value, or net worth, then there's a perfect guide inside of this story to show you how it's done. Well, thank you, Daniel. It's been lovely talking to you, and I'm sure by now our viewers are looking forward to getting their hands on your book. Uh, that was Daniel Strauss, the author of The Billionaire Mindset and The Billionaire Career, and I'm Christine for Business. <music>